There once was a man who lived among mountains. All his life he dreamed and investigated his own dreams and other people's. He was a psychiatrist who talked about the soul, a scientist and a scholar, a man committed to finding meaning in our everyday lives. His dreams have changed our ideas. His name was Carl Gustav Jung. He wrote the first introduction to Zen Buddhism. He began with Greek mythology. Or didn't begin, but at least brought it in. He, uh, you know, the gods and the goddesses, the myths. He was concerned with the American Indians. He visited them. He was interested in synchronicity. He was interested in astrology. Um, and he wrote on all these subjects and had lots of good things to say about them. What's the value of your dreams? in the everyday world? What's the value of your fantasies in the everyday world? These are enormously important, the sense of having, of being a mess of complexes. Jung gave us all that. It's a cliche to talk about now the meaning of life or something being meaningful or not meaningful. And I think Jung in a way is responsible uh, for this kind of, of cliche. Carl Gustav Jung's work brought dreams and the unconscious into the modern world and introduced a respect for the psyche in human affairs. Now, Dr. Jung, we've been talking about the early in 1957, uh, aged 82, Jung gave his first film interview. His thoughts touch upon universal questions, from love, marriage and relationships to international hostilities. Characteristically, Jung expressed his political thoughts in terms of the psyche. Nowadays, particularly, the the world hangs on a thin thread, yeah. and that is the psyche of man. We are the great danger. The psyche is the great danger. What if something goes wrong with the psyche? Huh. Yeah. You see? Since his death in 1961, Jung's ideas have become increasingly influential. His work in the world has been extended into the psychological study of war and war trauma. Architecture. Alcoholism and drug addiction. The stock market. Aging, senility and death. Even movies and movie stars. In many countries, especially the United States, Jungian psychology is tackling new themes. For San Francisco analyst John Beebe, it's the movies. Whenever uh, you see a film uh, uh, in a dream, someone is watching a film or going to the movies, that's a not uncommon uh, dream image. Um, I think it means that um, uh, we're looking at a situation that has been thoroughly studied. It's been uh, cut and edited, so to speak, and honed in on and presented for us, and it's a completely understood situation now, and if we just watch it through, we will have a complete sense of what it is. In the book that was compiled from a series of his seminars on dreams, Jung himself spoke of the psychological vitality of film. The movies are far more efficient than the theatre. They are less restricted. They are able to produce amazing symbols to show the collective unconscious, since their methods of presentation are so unlimited. Because in our own individual life, we only get a chance to see perhaps one little piece of a whole archetypal pattern. But in a movie, we can have the whole pattern laid out for us in a couple of hours. And in a great enough film, there's really a sense of having been translocated from one's own personal experience and the little pit that one has experienced to something truly universal. And I think that's what the, the archetype can do. It's sort of a, a ticket of admission um, to a broader perspective. The patients who came to consult Jung at his house in Kusnacht varied widely, from American heiresses and the German writer Hermann Hesse to the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. Dr. Jeffrey Satinover. Basically, the motive for starting Alcoholics Anonymous came out of a patient of Jung's experience. 
and Jung's communicating to that patient the idea that essentially he was not going to ever successfully get over his alcoholism if he did not find God. The official history of Alcoholics Anonymous traces the group's origins to Jung's diagnosis of the incurable alcoholic known only as Roland H. His craving for alcohol was the equivalent on a low level of the spiritual thirst of our being for wholeness, expressed in medieval language, the union with God. What people seek in addictive experience is something which in and of itself is normal. That, that is to say, the craving is normal. The craving for certain kinds of elation, for a certain sense of specialness, for heroism, for cessation of pain, and underlying all of those really, ultimately and, and most powerful, is the uh, seeking of a sense of meaningfulness. Dr. Jeffrey Satinova has established a clinic specializing in senility and Alzheimer's disease and addiction to drugs and alcohol. You've seen some of the early signs of it already. The therapy goes beyond the alcoholic or senile patient to include other family members. What we hope an individual will gain from the psychotherapeutic dimension of substance abuse treatment is a way of finding meaning in their lives again. Because, as Jung correctly recognized, ultimately the, the key motivating factor in the beginning of an addiction is the seeking of spirit. When Roland H. first arrived in his consulting room, Jung told him that unless he could find a way to a religious or spiritual experience, his addiction was incurable. You see, alcohol in Latin is spiritus. And you use the same word for the highest religious experience as well as for the most depraving poison. The helpful formula, therefore, is spiritus contra spiritum. Dionysus uh, was not the god of drunkenness. He was the god of ecstatic vision. He was a god of wine, but that was the wine of religion, not the wine of drunkenness. For Robert Johnson, the Greek god Dionysus offers an insight into the modern epidemic of alcoholism. Johnson draws on mythology for fables of psychological reality. His latest book considers the gods of antiquity and our universal need for emotional highs or ecstasy. It is basic and if we don't get our ecstasy, which is an archetypal quality, in a legitimate way, we will get it in an illegitimate way which accounts for much of the chaos of this culture now. We have to have an ecstatic dimension of our life. In all ancient cultures, the heights of the mountains and the heavens have been identified as the place of the gods. Moses received the Ten Commandments from his god on the mountaintop. The Greek gods dwelt on Mount Olympus. The Pueblo Indians live close to their father's son on the 6,000-foot-high plateau of New Mexico. The metaphor of height applied to a mental state is, is universal. And when an individual seeks the experience of getting high, the implication is that they chronically, or as a matter of course, do not feel high. But the modern age has conquered all the heights had even invaded the heavens. Jung was dismayed. The gods have become diseases. Zeus no longer rules Olympus, but rather the solar plexus, and produces curious specimens for the doctor's consulting room, or disorders the brains of politicians and journalists, who unwittingly let loose psychic epidemics on the world. That's a quote from Dr. Jung. He said, when we dismantled Olympus, we turn the gods into symptoms. If there's not, this is only a restatement of a moment ago, if we don't get a particular archetypal quality legitimately, it will, so to speak, pop up somewhere in its symptomatic, that is, its compulsive form. <laughs> The Swiss analyst Adolf Guggenbull Craig, perhaps surprisingly, sees the business world as another example of the archetypal quest for the gods or the soul. 
when you deal with money, you really know if you're right or wrong. You know, you lose or you win. There's no argument. You lost or you win. And it might give you then an elated feeling, nearly a religious feeling that you were on the right side, that you were so much in touch with the gods that you actually won. The speculators, the people who really only deal with money, they don't really deal with money as a thing to buy something with, but they deal with money because they want to get more gold or they want to get more soul in the end. I think the speculators speculate that they think they can get a life essence by having more and more money. The business world remains a masculine world. It was Jung's view that masculine patriarchal values have produced a culture which neglects the soul and the balancing influence of the feminine psyche. Analyst Andrew Samuels. Jung intuited an imbalance in Western culture in favor of one whole style of psychological and behavioral functioning, in favor of analysis, in favor of logic, in favor of external achievement, in favor of social hierarchicalism and so forth. He asked, what happened to the other side? He entered into reflection, both conscious and unconscious, at a time when, culturally, the role of women was changing and shifting. People began to protest and wanted the vote and so on. So he contributed to something which has become a movement of our times. I think the feminine stands against organization, for example, against organized religion. It stands against hierarchy, for example, class systems. It stands against an over-dependence on logic and rationality so that the hard sciences are challenged. It stands against an excessive dependency on technology and so it espouses natural issues, an interest in ecology, in the environment. We women embody life. You men act upon life. That resonates psychologically, which means that we are constantly working with it in terms of our aims, our ideals, our understandings and perceptions of what it's like to be ourselves now and in life. Jung observed that for every woman there was a masculine aspect within her psyche the archetype of the animus, and for every man, a feminine counterpart, the anima. The anima is, is an archetype, uh, an archetypal form expressing the fact that a man has a minority of feminine or female uh, genes. Yeah. And that is something that doesn't appear, disappear in him, that is constantly present. And it works as a female in a man. The same is the case with the animus. That is a masculine image in a woman's mind, uh, which is not ex sometimes quite conscious. Sometimes it is not conscious, but it is called into life the moment that woman meets a man who says the right things. And then because he said it, it is all true, and he is, he is the fellow. No matter what he is. Yeah. And the whole point is that the female ego has to be in charge of the animus. Now, that's not a, a generally accepted idea because the old hangover of you lean on men and men will somehow make your life interesting or something, and you just lose all your own ideas or innovations or creativity and I think a lot of women are scared out of being who they are and doing whatever is important to them still. The animus to me is one of the most significant concepts that has arisen in Jungian psychology. Um, it speaks of the function that connects 
a woman with her deepest self and personhood, her creativity, the unform that's forming as she ages, her work, her word, her ideas, herself, her person. <laughs> In the Alfred Hitchcock film, Notorious, John Beebe finds a drama of the animus in the conflict between a woman and men. Just a minute, Miss Huberman. Hold it, Miss Huberman. Way, would you please? We'd like a statement from you, Miss Huberman, about your father. For instance, do you think your father got what he deserved? Could we say that you're pleased your father's going to pay the penalty for being a German worker? Now, notice the way the woman is badgered by a series of men. All the people holding uh, cameras are men, and all the people who speak to her are men. And so you immediately get the image of a woman in a vulnerable position, badgered by uh, a group or a series of men. Now, there's the perfect image of what Jung means by the animus, the way the animus attacks the woman and the way it's often symbolized by a multiple figure or a crowd and the way it moves in on the woman and judges her. The cameras are all on the lower left hand of the screen. And then gradually, we realize that in the lower left hand, there is now one man whose viewpoint we have. And he's a dark, kind of unknown figure. She's half attracted to him, half uh, suspicious of him, wonders, is he a policeman? This is the uh, experience of so many women of constantly being under an attack. Do I look OK? Is my reputation OK? The camera turns, and finally, he becomes a personality in his own right. Indeed, he's Cary Grant. There's one more drink left to peace. Shame about the ice. So that the very critic, the very thing that's most attacking the woman, is also somehow the thing that's most erotically exciting, and the most interesting, and the most energetic. And there, in a little nutshell, you get if you, the problem of the animus. Now, you see, the archetype is a force, it has an autonomy. It can suddenly seize you. It is like a seizure. So, for instance, falling in love at first sight, yeah. that is such a case. You see, you have a certain image in yourself without knowing it of the woman, of the real woman. Yeah. Now you see that girl, or at least a good imitation of your type, yeah. and instantly you get a seizure. And you're, you're gone. Yeah. And afterwards, you may discover that it was a hell of a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> the concepts of animus and anima emerged as Jung observed the lives and psychological realities of his patients. And they help in understanding both the pain and the delights of human relationship. Robert Johnson. Man insists upon making some outer figure, generally a flesh and blood woman, bear his anima for him. That is, he mediates uh, the outer world by way of his anima instead of using her inside where she belongs. This produces more suffering and more upset and more pain than any other single thing that I know about. Oh, you see, a man is quite capable, or uh, he's intelligent enough to see that that woman of his choice, as one says, not no choice, he has been captured. You know, he sees that she is no good at all, that she is a hell of a business. And, and he, he tells me so, and he says, for God's sake, doctor, help me to get rid of that woman. He can't. He's, he's like playing a thing. And that is the archetype. That is so-called archetype of the anima. This contribution of Jung's animus and anima theory is not only of immense use in understanding relationship difficulties and the joys and richnesses of relationships, but it's actually something, as with all the best ideas, that people, ordinary people, are doing anyway. 
That's a real acid test of all psychological theory. If it really turns out to be a description of what's happening, it's good theory. James Hillman was director of studies at the Jung Institute in Zurich. After 25 years in Switzerland, he returned to America, to Dallas, Texas. The soundtrack to your weekend lifestyle. 106.1, The Oasis. Hillman analyzes patients' dreams, but also sees the image of psyche in the architecture of cities and the shape and atmosphere of a landscape. The modern city is not for people, it's for business. And you drive in from the suburbs, you drive your car underground, put it in the garage, you don't come into the street at all, and then go up the elevator, and that's it. Walk up and down the halls, you could be in any kind of office building, and it's nothing to do with people. The thing about Dallas would be, see, the, the thing about the psyche in the world is that it's in the world, and it's the places themselves have a psyche. And that psyche speaks through how it displays itself. What do we see in this building? What is this building displaying itself as? So that it has to have no openings on the ground floor for people, but just repelling walls. What is it for a building to be absolutely skinny and bare-boned and stretching way up and empty on the interior with an atrium? I mean, that's an anorexic building. What are mirrored sunglasses telling us? We certainly can't look into the soul of the person into his eyes or her eyes. It's again that paranoid perspective of I can see you, but you can't see me. You, you feel different things in different buildings. But it isn't only that, it isn't, it's also the way the room is lit, with a light coming straight down on you that casts no shadow, windows that can't be opened. You're in a little prison room. So of course you're going to have illnesses inside offices and psychological breakdown which you can't just clarify by going to an analyst once a week. There's a darkness in the soil here. New England has the dead Indians and the dead witches and the dead Puritans and the, you know, we're, we're walking over the dead here, really. And they, they give the soil more, uh, the psyche of the soil, much more um, sadness. This sense of the soil having blood in it gives depth to, uh, gives soul to a place. Now, if the mood is in the landscape, not just in your eye, but the mood is in the landscape, then uh, it's got a soul. And what the history of the landscape will be there, too. Jung observed the unchanging human need for archetypal experiences. Today, the gods have vanished, and we seek ecstasy and meaning in wealth and power, drugs and alcohol, or the lives of the famous. We project our fantasies onto public figures, political leaders, royalty, sporting heroes, musicians and movie stars. The collective unconscious is too big to live out personally. It's like asking someone to cope with the 100,000 volt power in a high tension line through the 110 volt wiring of, of the house to live out the collective unconscious himself. Much of it has to be lived by projection. I think there's no question um, that the person involved can get quite confused with the archetypal image that's being portrayed, and that can confuse people on both sides of the screen, so to, so to speak. Well, the famous example is Marilyn Monroe, and uh, in uh, a dream, uh, which she apparently uh, reported to someone and was written down, she was standing uh, naked in a church and all kinds of people were coming in and uh, worshipping her there. And, uh, of course, 
simply said this is the love goddess, but in its religious aspect. It seems to me that um, her education and her consciousness and the amount of uh, uh, security she had in her early background didn't give her uh, a strong enough ego or a strong enough uh, personality to um, stand up to an archetypal image like that and, and criticize it and say, well, it's as if in some way uh, my image is terribly important to people and has religious significance and no wonder there's so little goddess in our culture no wonder they would use me in this way and I think there the person gets swallowed uh, by the image these men are veterans of the Vietnam War to Jungian psychologists as to Jung himself War and war experiences are just as psychological as falling in love. Harry Wilmer. It isn't just there is good, there is evil, but there is both, and there's both in us. And that connects with the shadow, with the dark side. That's something I never understood prior to the, the kind of Jungian work that, that I did. Jung observed that in personal relationships and the dealings between communities, the dark side, or the shadow, exists alongside bright and positive qualities. And he saw that the shadow, when not accepted and understood, will be projected within marriage, within the workplace, within warfare, and within dreams. The young Americans who were drafted in their tens of thousands to fight the Vietnam War failed to achieve victory. The psychological wounds they suffered are not yet healed. Harry Wilmer. The war experience obviously was no different than any other war experience. We didn't call it a war. We called it a conflict, it was a police action. We were dealing with a enemy that was a foreign body, if you want to put it that way, we wanted to exterminate. The consequences were that it permitted us to deny the existence of these men who were as heroic as any men in any war and to project our shadow. We call them losers and dope fiends and uh, baby killers and all the things that we despise. Harry Wilmer works with Vietnam veterans in Texas. Even 20 years after the war, Many veterans still carry the burden of military failure and the blame for the horrors of war. They carried the image of losing. They carried the image of destructivity, of violence, of darkness, and even evil, which is in all of us. When these men came home, nobody wanted to acknowledge them. Nobody wanted to hear what they had to say. Many of Dr. Wilmer's veteran patients suffered from recurring nightmares of their own war experiences or of terrible violence and carnage which happened to others. The dreams to me represent the only uncontaminated history we have of the war. It's as if it is there now. And, you know, Jung talks about the reality of the psyche. It was as if I had the privilege of, if you want to call it the privilege, the painful privilege of being in the Vietnam War. This is the story of one of those dreams. This was Bill, who had lost his leg in a mine explosion, a landmine. And he had had this dream several times a week for many years. Nobody listened to them. The dream was we were on a search and destroy mission, and we were going through a friendly village. A baby was crying in a hooch. That's a little native house. 
and no one else was there. And uh, my buddy went into the hooch and he saw the crying baby. And the captain at the, at the outside shouted, don't pick it up, don't pick it up. But he didn't hear the words and he reached for the baby and he picked the baby up and the baby exploded. It was booby trapped. There was nothing left of the baby and just parts of my friend. And uh, it was grenades. And he could never get over that cry or that sound or that somehow or another he hadn't done something. And that's a kind of typical combat nightmare. They stay the same, repeat over and over and over. American GIs were killed by booby-trapped babies in Vietnam, but Bill had not seen such horrors. His recurring nightmare reflected his own maiming in other circumstances. For the first time, Dr. Wilmer accepted Bill's dream as a real experience. The possibility of transformation and of healing begins when a new, unrealistic element arises in the dream. Something comes into the dream that didn't really happen. After all, if you dream 12 years of this and wake up in a cold sweat and a horror, thinking you're still there, when something happens in the dream that didn't really happen, it begins to take you out of that primal experience. And then the next stage is what I call the healing nightmare. When it is trans formed or when it next becomes a stage of an ordinary hallucinatory nightmare. Didn't happen, couldn't have happened far out, the kind of dreams that we all have from time to time. The healing nightmare allows the psyche to adapt from the horrors of combat to the normal processes of the unconscious. For Vietnam veterans, there were none of the parades or rituals which traditionally greet homecoming warriors on their return to ordinary life. There were no rites to sortie. There were no rituals. There was no way people were dumped 50, 60 hours from Vietnam into Des Moines, Iowa, or wherever. And there was nobody there. Al John is a Vietnam veteran who was shot down in combat. After he returned home to the Navajo reservation in Arizona, his overwhelming war memories returned repeatedly. I started having the backlash of what happened you know, when I got shut down and they had told me to let's go see that medicine man. They told me that uh, I had some stuff that uh, I was still carrying from me right now. My memory is still back there. My memory is still in uh, the outside world of uh, the Navajo Reservation. Navajo medicine men perform chants to cure physical or psychological illness and to mark major events in the lives of members of the tribe. One chant is sung to mark the return of the warrior and is still used today. I had a sing on me, uh, one different, one kind, a song called uh, the Navajo Way, Seven Days. That kind of got straightened out. And then I got after that, summertime I had another one on the squad dance and so that really got me my mind back together I think. well we didn't have that and we need that and the Indians and all introverted cultures have ways of dealing with this and, and we must learn from that But then, with the memorial in Washington, this 400-foot black marble names of every veteran, that had a profound effect. That was the beginning of American grieving and of America's acknowledgement. You look at that, you know, and you see your own face in the dark granite behind the names. Navajo rituals are sung, and these veterans sing, to rehabilitate themselves in their culture. They were forced to carry the shadow of the American military involvement in Vietnam for failing to win and for the atrocities committed in war. And the shadow can only be lifted when it is understood. 
And I think that the rituals that go on now in hospitals or in groups uh, with therapists of all sorts, self-help groups, these are the way. And it must touch other people too, not just the veterans, their families, their children, the world. The men became the war. And that is the very destructive thing, because we are those men. Just as Jung worked with the dreams that arose from the unconscious of his patients, so sand play provides the space and freedom for the unconscious to express itself in concrete pictures. Dora Kalf is a Jungian, but not a conventional analyst. I think, you know, you can only play when you're really free. You know, you have to be free within. What Jung said, you know, that this uh, psyche has a healing tendency is really shown in the sand pictures because this healing tendency in a way is able to take over when we are providing this free and protected space. Jung believed in certain psychological necessities, a sense of meaning or religion, honesty with oneself and with others, and respect for the dreams and fantasies produced by the unconscious. He also believed in play. Every creative individual whatsoever owes all that is greatest in his life to fantasy. The dynamic principle of fantasy is play, a characteristic also of the child, and as such it appears inconsistent with the principle of serious work. It is short-sighted to treat fantasy on account of its risky or unaccountable nature as a thing of little worth. They can tell me stories, they can ta talk about their life, but we do not interpret. Because what I have observed, that when we start to do this way of sand play, that we can observe a kind of a process you know, that leads into the inner realms of the personality. And maybe each time they touch even a deeper level, the patient shows you what comes from within. And the therapist sees from outside and understands what he wants to tell you through the symbolic language, you see. We would say that the people who play here, they also come into the collective unconscious, you know. And the collective unconscious means that this is meaningful for all people, that there are those symbols that are meaningful, not only, let's say, for Switzerland, but maybe just as well for England or in a different uh, continent. For instance, when they take Oriental or Far Eastern symbols, I think that they are near the bottom of their unconscious. Our culture has moved away from the instinctual life. And this is why we have various animals at display. We have, for instance, wild animals and this could indicate for a person that they have not been in contact with their instincts. In the sound trays of one patient, Dora Kalf observes the transforming powers of the psyche, which can also be seen in dream analysis. This young man didn't know what to do with his life, but after a series of sound trays, something changed dramatically and he made a positive decision. He came and he said, I have decided to, start me to study medicine. And I was quite surprised because we never talked about, you know, 
what he should study or what he should do. And then he made this picture. This is a city with the traffic and the police directing the traffic. And uh, we have all these houses, they have no windows. And therefore I felt it was a very anonymous situation. Also, I don't think that these people pay any attention to who they encounter. And then there is the concrete of the place. And through this concrete breaks this beautiful flower. Now, what does that mean, you see? That although he lives in such a surrounding, and he may have had no contact through his inner life, he felt all of a sudden, you see, that something was more important eh, than all the surroundings that he was living in. We would never see that a white rose would be able to break through concrete. Eh? But these energies are so strong, once they are awakened, that they can do nearly impossible things. The followers of Jung, who are old enough to have known him well, are now in their last years themselves. Jung's work began with his own inner life, and for these analysts, the arrival of old age and the approach of death is an opportunity to observe what the unconscious has to say. When one is preparing for death, uh, uh, which is what I've been busy doing for the last 10 years, sounds lugubrious, but at my age it isn't. I've had an incredibly rich life, and, and uh, as I said, I call God Albert, and if they threw the switch on me tomorrow night time, uh, I would scrawl, Dear Albert, thank you, Joe. You know, this is my feeling about it. Dr. Dr. Adolf Guggenbull Craig, a Zurich analyst, has recently published a book called Old Fools. When I was young, I obviously hoped that one day I will understand what's going on. And uh, I was in some way admiring the people who were older because I thought they knew what they were talking about. And then all of a sudden one morning I woke up and I was old myself and wasn't a bit wiser and saw that I don't understand much or even understand some things less. And that's a bit depressing. Today, uh, old age is not appreciated very much. There are too many old people, so sometimes I'm ashamed to be still here with my 85 years. And the value which people give to old age is how young they feel, how useful. Well, that's a kind of tremendous pressure on these poor old people. They have not only to look younger, they even have to be more experienced and more clever and so on. Uh, I think it's an insult if you say to an old person, you look very young. So what sort of 85-year-old lady do you wish to feel? Feel? I feel that I wish to feel as I feel. I'm quite satisfied. I don't want to, to be different. No. I saw that one advantage, one uh, possibility in old age, which has been depicted in images too, is that when you're old, you don't have to care so much anymore. And when you're old, you can say, what the hell, what does it matter if people think I'm an idiot or if I'm an old fool? And so the, the archetype of the old fool is really a fuller archetype than the old wise man, who is a one-sided uh, propaganda gimmick of older people to dominate the younger ones. Jungian analysts share a conviction that life has meaning, though it may be found only in retrospect, and though the meaning may be purely personal and of no wider significance. Aniela Jaffe. What is meaning? We create meaning, and that's so important. Afterwards, if I look back my my long, long life, and there were things which were very difficult for me, if you try to understand your dreams and your fantasies, then perhaps you can, uh, you can find a meaning. Looking back, what Jung thought, reflection, reflection, looking back. <laughs> I was married, and it, it was, uh, uh, we were very, very young, 20 and 21. 
And, but it didn't last very long. So we divorced. And I thought, oh, what, what can that mean? It is, uh, was ridiculous. Two students marrying and then going, going away. The meaning for me was this, me, this match saved my life because I got the Swiss passport. He was Swiss and I could go to Switzerland. I came to you. These are the details, you see, which life creates, which one doesn't understand. But decades later, one understands. You see, I'm very old and for a very, very long time, I didn't feel old. And I thought that I could and should, not so much should, but that one just did, went on doing the same things when one was 85 or 86 or 89, uh, than, if one, than the things one did when one was 60 or 70. And I did not heed Jung at the time, because I was very surprised sometimes when Jung, when he was about oh, end of 60, because 70s, in the 70s, didn't do this or didn't do that because he said he was too old and I couldn't understand it. Jung used to say, if you can't take a hint from life, then life will hit you. And that I think is true. There were hints which I could have taken, and I didn't. And so I had to break my leg <laughs> before I uh, was ready or willing or able to understand what it really was about. Particularly, I felt uh, uh, some kind of relief almost that I could be old. That. I was permitted to be old. It was the most extraordinary experience. And through that experience, I realized how wise Jung was. As Jung himself grew older, he spent more time at his tower in Bolingen, where he withdrew to think, write, and remember, to carve, to dream, and perhaps above all, simply to play. In his childhood, Jung's games and fantasies gave him his first glimpses of the unconscious. For this remarkable man, half Swiss peasant and half world famous intellectual, play contained images and meaning as real as the concrete world around him. His grandson, Dieter Baumann. He played all the time. Uh, in, in Bollingen he did his so-called uh, waterworks, uh, uh, namely he dug into, uh, the, you see the slope by the lake there is saturated with water and so uh, the, the water kind of oozes out of it. And so he had a system of rivulets uh, which he connected into a mainstream uh, and then that went to the lake and already as a boy I uh, I think when I was eight years old, I, I helped him uh, there. I remember my son visiting Bollingen once when he was a little boy because he was a friend of the grandchildren of Jung. And then he came home and he said, oh, mommy, there was an old gentleman. And you know, he made all those little rivers in the, in the earth. We were playing ne next to the lake. And he wondered why he did this. We know that every good idea and all creative work are the offspring of the imagination and have their source in what one is pleased to call infantile fantasy. Without this playing with fantasy, no creative work has ever yet come to birth. The debt we owe to the play of imagination is incalculable. It must not be forgotten that it is just in the imagination that a man's highest value may lie. Jung's life, 85 years long, was devoted to the reality of the psyche and the play of his imagination. 
no one can doubt the impact he has had on our age. For most of his life, he worked against the popular current of worldly perspectives, bringing unfamiliar ideas and unsettling observations to light. If today the unconscious is more than a mere abstraction, and if the psyche has become a reality, we owe that largely to the scientist and doctor who listened to the wisdom of the dream. Carl Gustav Jung.